about the unconditional love of God and we should and it is true that God loves us unconditionally I'm glad about that but we hear very little about God's anticipatory love that for the unconditional love there is something that the father anticipates of us more than expect but anticipate now, concerning God's un unconditional love, and no one can doubt it, because it's true. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The text, John 3, 16 doesn't tell us what the world did that made God love it so much. It just says God so loved the world. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. What did the world do to cause God to love it so much. What did we have of value? What made God love us so much that he gave his only begotten son? Humanity is made up of many. Jesus is unique. There's nobody like him. So what did God see in man that would make God love us so much that he would give his only unique only unique Son. The answer is nothing. Hence, unconditional. There was nothing in the human race. Nothing that we had to offer that God needed that God wanted, that God had to have, that would make God better. There was nothing that we could proffer. There was nothing that we could offer. He did not look on us and see talent that he needed. The answer is nothing. Hence, the unconditional love of God. What, what condition did mankind come up to to make God love us so much? The answer is nothing. None. We didn't. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, but God displayed, King James says commendeth, God commendeth 
his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were wicked, lost, ungodly. It didn't say while we were wise, righteous, cool, smart, scholarly. None of those things applied to us at all. Christ died for humanity while humanity was lost. I know this is kind of messing with the minds of some of you because you thought that God loved you because you were so wonderful. And then some of these artists, see, you can't get your theology from some of these artists. He, uh, people didn't see the good in me, but he looked down on me and he saw the best in me. And he, he got that, no, 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 no. That's not what God saw. That's not what God saw. That's not, that, that, no, no. And that's what makes the unconditional love unconditional. There was nothing. There was nothing that the human race had. There was nothing that humans had produced. There was nothing good that humans did that made God love us so. Well, why did he love us? Because he does. It's from him. It's not, it's not, it's not. See, it's not like philia love. Filial love, the love between a man and a woman, love between friends. This is love based on what we have in common. That's why you, when you, you know, one of the keys to, to marrying somebody, you need to have something in common. See, so you, need, you need to look beyond your hips and shoulders and see what you have in common. Because if you don't have anything in common, it's not going to last. Praise the Lord. Common ground. That's filial love. Agape is that benevolent love that God possesses, that humans are incapable of possessing all of our own to the extent that God does. Now, humans still have it, but not on God's level. Because see, the agape causes you to do what is right for the person who is the object of that love. Whether they want you to do that or not. A parent, because they love their child, will say no sometimes. The child may stick out their lips, but the parent, the child may feel like they're being punished, but they're not being punished. That's agape love. You're doing what's best. Are you following me? God does what's best for us at all times. And he loves us. Woo! Unconditionally. First John chapter 4. And verse 9, I'm going to move on. The Bible says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son, excuse me, into the world that we might live through him. Notice as the text talks about God's love. You still don't see anything that we did to earn it, to deserve it, to merit it. For that was nothing that we did. That was nothing that we could do. Let's be honest. Mankind had blown it. He took the first man. And 
the first woman. And God, you're talking about human beings' ability to just mess a thing up. God says, I'm going to make this very, 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 very easy for you to get right. I mean, God said, you can't miss with this. You, you, you just can't miss. Have you ever seen folk mess up things that you just, that you just can't get wrong? One plus one is six. I mean, some things you, you're not supposed to be able to miss on. God said to Adam, all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now don't think backyard garden. The Garden of Eden stretched from the river Euphrates to Havilah. Havilah is on the horn of Africa. Am I right? Now, if you know anything about geology, that's a huge swath of land. God says, for every tree in this whole garden, because I want you to till it, you gotta, you, you're going to be working every day. <laughs> God believes in working. Man gave us eight hours a day. God says six days a week thou shalt work. See, God gave him 12 hour work days. You're working all day. <laughs> Keep him out of trouble, you see. So he says, you, you, I, I'm going to fix this thing where Adam, you cannot get it wrong. You can eat of all these trees. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst. I'm going to set this one in the middle of the garden. Now you got hundreds if not thousands of miles. Millions of trees. Lakes, gullies, mountains, deserts. Get all of this. Just don't eat from this one tree. Now, if you want to build a playhouse in it, you can. If you want to sleep underneath it, you can. Oh, yeah. If you want to build your house in, in its shade, you can. Just don't eat of it. They mess that up. Now, how in the world did they even stumble upon that tree? Just one. I mean, you're talking about God making it easy. How'd you find that one? You're talking about a needle in the haystack. How'd you find that one tree? Eve, how did you end up there, you and Adam? Y'all had to really do some walking. <laughs> to get to that tree. And when they got to it, they recognized it. Turns out Adam wasn't that necessarily a good teacher because ladies, you know, they blame Eve messed it up, but Eve wasn't made, wasn't even created when God gave the, God gave the commandment. That's why when the Bible says that Eve was deceived and the man wasn't. See, we take that as a slight against uh, her. No, that's a slight against Adam. She was deceived. He wasn't. He did it knowing what he was doing. She was deceived because she didn't have a good teacher. Who was her teacher? Him. And while she's standing there talking to the serpent, you know what she had? She had no covering because her husband was not a leader. A, a regular man would have stepped in. That's, it. That's why I don't buy some of this stuff today about the role of men in the role. You know, the stay-at-home dads and the guys who are just comfortable. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Wife, make three times the money you and you happy with that. No, 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 no. You got to do something about that. I had to work five jobs. Right, now, I might, go, I might go through that for a minute, but that can't be for life. Because, Patrick Wood, I need to be needed. That's just me. 
I said, I need, I need, I need for Pam to need me. Praise the Lord. I, amen. Did you hear what she said? She said, I need you, baby. I need the old. Some of y'all not saying amen. amen. But I'm just saying. And what he did, instead of stepping in and saying, let me handle this. He said, uh, supper, you said another word to my wife, I'm going to slap you. She talked, the serpent talked her into eating of the fruit and she gave it to him. And when she gave it to him, he bit it. And when he ate of the tree, not her, when he did it, everything changed. Man went downhill from there. The next thing I know, in Genesis chapter 6, God looked and said, you know what? I'm sorry I made this whole race. You're talking about unconditional love. I'm sorry that I made the whole race. I'm going to destroy the whole thing. But Noah found grace. Now, what did Noah do to earn grace? The answer is nothing. For grace is, by definition, unmerited favor. It's unearned. Well, why did God save the human race? Because he wanted to. He still, Adam messed up, Eve messed up, mankind messed up till all their thoughts were evil continually. All of them messed up, but I still love them. So I'm not going to cut them off. Uh, Noah, build an ark. Build an ark, Noah. Build an ark. Praise the Lord. Get in it. Put your family in it. Grab, grab the animals. Uh, we can't use no scissors. It's got to be male and female. 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 Because if you get male and male, they ain't going to make it. Female and female, they ain't going to make it. Got to be male and female. Noah had that much sense. It's a good thing Noah wasn't alive today. Had an ark full of men. The seal would have died. No production, no reproduction. Male and female, as a male female construct in the first uh, 10 chapters in the Bible. And here we are now, and they wonder why I talk about this so much. I don't talk about it enough, and I wish I had more help. Would be nice. Would be nice. So, let me finish this story. Noah messed up and uh, so forth and so on and then when man, man couldn't get any worse Jesus said prepare me a body behold in the volume of the book it is written of me prepare me a body and Jesus the word the Greek word is kenosis kenosis means to step down Jesus took the great step down. Paul said, and being in the form of God, so high that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That is, he did not assume equality with, with God the Father was something that he had to forcibly take because he was equal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, there's the Father and the Word. He's always been. And yet, yet he took on the form of a servant and wrapped himself up in the likeness of a man and put on uh, a sinful flesh, and yet he never sinned. And came down here and lived the human experience and died for us and God raised him from the dead. What did we do to merit this kind of love? The answer is nothing. So when it comes down to the love of God and all that, get that baby.
bass out of your voice. Stop trying to act like you're more than what you are. You ain't that important. None of us are. Well, the Lord is using me because he sees stuff in me. No, that's a lie. He's, he's using you because he loves you. Amen. You ain't all that. None of us are. That's the unconditional love of God. Humans did nothing to merit it. Humans did nothing to deserve it. He loves us because he loves us. And I thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you so much for that, Lord. But here is my problem, my concern with those who teach about God's unconditional love. They present it as though it has no destination, no effort, no effect, excuse me, no aim, no goal, no purpose, that it has no intention. But the truth is that the unconditional love of God is supposed to have an effect on us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 again here, in verse 5, it says, And hope maketh not a shame. That is, hope in Christ does not disappoint. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God, that's that unconditional love, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Because of God's unconditional love, because his love has been shed abroad in our hearts. Are you praying for me? Or because it has been poured in our hearts. Hope in Christ, no matter how things work out, does not disappoint us. Because see, we know that no matter which way the wind blows, Jesus loves us. And if I have to go through this right now, it's, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love me. Uh, Keisha, thank you for sending me that. She sent me a, she, she gone through a mother's things and found a sermon where she had written a word out. And uh, she was quoting yours truly. I was so touched by it. Uh, but God, speaking of evangelist Peggy White, God decided to let the wind blow toward taking her home to go to heaven. She didn't lose. She didn't leave here without the love of God. That's why when it was time, she was all right. See, because when the, when the holy, when the love of God, when God's unconditional love is shared abroad in your heart, you understand that whatever happened, you still know that God loves you. Whether he let this baby live or he takes it prematurely, he still loves you. Whether life makes you shout or hurts your feelings, when the love of God, uh, Brother Malachi, had, and I'm so proud of you, man. Oh, uh, I thank God for you. We are, everybody's talking about you. Keep up the good work, my brother. You are a living testimony. Proud of you, man. When that love of God have been, we got some wonderful young folk here. When that love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, you can handle stuff because you know whether you're up or down, in or out, feel good or feel bad, you know that you're loved. Woo! And that, that he loves your mama with a love, that means that whatever is happening, uh, it's got to be best for you. Because if it wasn't good for you, he wouldn't let it happen because he loves your soul. See, see, see it, 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 it has an effect. It's not just a naked fact sitting out there, something meaningless. The love of God, the unconditional love of God is supposed to do something uh, to us. Yes, God loves us. I got to hurry up. He loves us unconditionally, but we must respond 
properly to God's love. Now, let's quickly go back to John chapter 3. I read verse 3, as I read 3.16. How about verse 17 and down? I'm talking about now properly responding to God's unconditional love. See, because some of us mean, think that God loving us unconditionally means you can do what you want to do. Drink, run the streets, fornicate, lie, and all that. But he just, he's just still loved. I mean, he still loves you. But, but there's a price to be paid for that misbehavior. I'm preaching. See, you can't, you can't stop at John 3.16 if there's verse 17. You got to keep reading. Now, verse 17 says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come to pass judgment to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. That's the whole point of verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. The world was already condemned. So Jesus didn't come to add to the condemnation. He came to give us a way out. He said, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him, he that believeth on Jesus, is not condemned. That is, he will not be declared to be guilty. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, watch this. And this is the condemnation. This is the sentence or this is the judgment this is the condemnation. Here's why lost folk are going to hell. That light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Here's what's going to condemn people that God sent his unconditional world, love into the world. He sent the light into the world. But humans, oh my, loved darkness. Uh, they loved error. They loved sinning. They loved missing the mark. They were happy in their wicked mess that when the unconditional love came, they loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil because they didn't want to stop doing what they were doing. We would rather have our sin than to have your Jesus. If, your, if having your Jesus means I got to stop doing my sin, I would rather have my sin and you can have your Jesus. That's the condemnation. That unconditional love came and men said to unconditional love, no. I don't want you because I don't want to give up what I'm doing. And see, one time, you know, they're trying to change the church now and try to make it where you can be saved and keep doing what you're doing. But you can't change it. See, unconditional love doesn't mean a free pass to do what you want. It means a free pass to get out of sin. It means somebody else paid the way so you can live holy and live right and be clean. But the Bible said that there are people who love their sin. That's what it is. And they have said to God's unconditional love. I've got to hurry up. I don't want it. 
And look what it says. Look what it says. Verse 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. And this is something that the church don't get. Hey, bishops, leaders, pastors, superintendents, elders, ministers, district missionaries, supervisors, praise the Lord, uh, licensed and deaconess and evangelists, missionaries and all of them. You all need to know that the world hates us. And the world hates Jesus. See, while we're playing, they ain't playing. We're, we're trying to preach for money. They're trying to get your honey. They're trying to destroy our children. They're trying to destroy our minds. That, that explains all this shallow preaching you hear. These guys and gals act like they don't know what time it is. Perhaps they don't know. But you better know this, that the world hates biblical Christianity. Oh yeah, they ain't playing. They're not playing. They hate it. This is why... That's what, this is what kills critical race theory. Dead. The cure to past racism is current racism. How can that be when the Bible says that we're not to be overcome with evil? But we're supposed to overcome evil with good. Where have you ever read in the Bible that you become what you loathe? We are warned not to do that. So uh, the way we deal now with past racism is through now current racism. Where is that in the Bible? Whatever happened to as you would men do unto you, do you also unto them likewise. Y'all not cheering me on now. Whatever happened to it? Whatever happened to it? See, they, these folks, trying to make us think that they're concerned about the plight of black folk. They're not concerned about us. They are after biblical Christianity because every position they take is a position that is against scripture, but it's got you thinking that they're trying to look out for you. So we want reparation. I'm telling you right now, praise the Lord, the truth is, and uh, you won't like what I'm getting ready to say, we are the reparation. Ah, forefathers and parents from years ago, two or three generations ago, knew that what they were fighting for would never materialize in their lifetime. But they fought anyhow. They knew when they encountered bull, uh, bull Connor's dogs, and by the way, Bull Connor was a Democrat. They, they knew just you know they knew when he all them dogs and hoses that they put on black folk and indignities they knew in the 1930s when it was still legal to lynch blacks and to burn blacks and as we fought they knew that, that, that things would never change in their lifetime but if we could fight for the children, if we could keep pushing, hope, hoping that someday they'd be able to walk and sit in at any lunch counter they want, someday they'd be able to go to any college that they want to go, someday they could be in movies, someday they could go to law school, medical school, someday they could be teachers and principals and astronauts and even the president of the United States and even the vice president, someday, 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 if, if that can happen and you can find them in, find black folk everywhere, millionaires living all up in Martha's Vineyard, all of these places, go to Rodale Drive, find us there, oh my, someday, if we could reap that, those people, since we didn't get 40 acres in a mule, 
they would be reparations enough. And then they would in turn turn around and be law abiding. They would in turn turn around and not get on drugs and not be drunks and not wear their pants hanging off their rear ends. Amen. Not put tattoos all over their bodies. Oh God. Not uh, pierce the ears of the little bit of children. Not learn all this craziness and they sure wouldn't spend all their time out protesting because the doors have been open. All they got to do is walk in because America has come a long way. That's the pay. You didn't give us 40 acres and a mule, but, but, but if that can happen, then that's good. And lo and behold, it has happened. Now what are you doing with it? What, what are we doing with it? What? Say something to me. If all of this opportunity, you blow it being stupid. If all of the doors that have, have opened for us, you see us everywhere. You can't watch the news and we're not, we're not reporting it. Praise the Lord. You can't watch the weather and we're not telling that. Can't watch any sports channel and we're not in that. Uh, go, go to any movie. Go just look around. Praise the Lord to some of the finest schools, law schools, medical schools. Oh, you find us everywhere. I'm much more valuable to my mother as a reparation than 40 acres and a mule would have ever been. What's she going to do with a mule? <laughs> but sell it. Put my mom out there behind no mule. But you know what? She got a reparation though. <laughs> Made in America. I got to, I got to hurry up. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching. I got to hurry up, but I'm telling you the truth. You see, I, they, got, they got us thinking that they're so concerned about us. Why? We're doing good. The other girl at UNC, you, 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 see, you see them all of them arguing about uh, whether or not the lady should have gotten tenure personally. I believe that she should have gotten tenure if everybody else that had that position, if you're going to give them the position and you give them tenure, give her tenure too. And if she don't deserve the tenure, don't give her the position. But the, but all the sisters, boy, they were arguing and talking and pointing their fingers. But now, how many, talk about the change they want to make on the campus of uh, UNC, right? How many HBCUs are there? See, if you're going to do all that talk, why not just go to an HBCU? Praise the Lord. You, you, know, you know why? You know why? See? 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 You, you have to, you have to, uh, well, she should have a right to go anywhere she wants. She should. And she does. And she did. I'm walking a little bit too heavy today. Just, brother and sister Davis, I hope I don't, I hope I don't run you all off. Amen. You don't like me. You don't like me. You don't like what I'm saying. What are you doing with the opportunities? Why are you out there acting the fool? Why you can't hold a job? Pull your pants up. Our history says we've come from too far. We've been through too much to look like that. These people don't love us. They, they hate the light. And neither come they to the light. I got the clothes. Lest their deeds should be reproved. Now, if, if you understand the word here, reprove, it comes from a Greek word to be proven wrong. Put to shame, uncovered, discovered. That's what the world, you know, the rapper got mad, got in trouble. They started canceling his, I don't know him, his pro, his uh, shows because he accurately described homosexual sex. 
See, in America now, it's not a, they, don't, they don't mind if you participate in it. You just can't describe it unless you're one of them and you're describing it. Now, they can describe it in glowing, wicked, ungodly terms and nobody get canceled. But if you describe it and talk about it for the doggish behavior that it is, and the inhuman, praise the Lord, wicked behavior that it is, then hey, all of a sudden, here comes the world saying you're insensitive. So now, the rapper, the rapper was charged with a homosexual slur. Now, that, that amazes me. Rappers slur everybody. That's what rap is. It's a slur. Rappers slur white folk, black folk, and sisters. Sisters, sisters, where are my sisters? If I was a rapper, the word that I, if I'm talking to you, it wouldn't start with an S. It wouldn't be sisters. It would start with a B. And you know it. That's all they do. And nobody cancels them when they slur you. And then the, and as soon as the man says something about a couple of homosexuals, they want to cancel him the devil is a liar call our women bees and hoes all day and y'all go buy the music and shake your rump to it something's wrong with you and then he says something about a homosexual it is wickedness it is repugnant it is ungodly and it ain't something a man who's in his right mind would ever participate in I got in trouble. I'm a Facebook, YouTube, I don't know if I'm still on. But I got in trouble. They tried to ambush me, ambush journalism. They tried to ambush me because of something I said. And they had me to go on in San Francisco, California. It's called ambush journalism. Ambush. I got ambushed. And they were so nice. That's how they ambush you. They set you up. But I have the Holy Ghost. So I can see, I can see around the corner. So I see you coming. See, John said, John said, I got the burning bush. I can see you coming. And so, yes, Reverend, the doctor would. And we're so glad to have you on today. Oh, I'm so happy to have you, that you had me. And yes, you know, you, this is uh, San Francisco radio. Okay, so I'm not. Okay, shots fired. So I know where I am. And uh, uh, yes, with your, uh, this is when we're fighting for the definition of marriage. And they said to me, said, we heard that you said something uh, that was kind of outrageous. And I just wanted to get you on and see if you needed to, wanted to, you know, kind of take it back or explain. Or, or did you say? So I said, okay, well, what was it that I said? They said, they said, well, well, we heard you say, and you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, men with men and women with women, and, and you said that, uh, that, uh, the, I hate to tell you, uh, I hate to tell you, uh, you said that uh, the uh, anus is not a vagina. Did you say that? I said, yeah. <laughs> is, is that, is that, yes. And that's why that man, will never be a woman and he's wrong and he's destroying his own body. I said, yeah, 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 I said it, I said it. And I told him, I said, and you know what? If the doctors, see, a lot of these doctors are going to hell. If the medical community would just tell people, just tell people the truth, a whole lot of folks get delivered just on that. And I ain't talking about AIDS either. I, before then, the, Brothers, you wasn't made to have sex with a brother. Now you're going to destroy yourself. I hope I'm still, y'all give me some love if I'm still there. If Facebook, YouTube, I might be gone for about six months. But you know I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. How many women agree with that? All right. How many men agree with that? That's what I'm talking about. Let me, let me go home. Let me close. The Bible said that concerning, now I'm shifting. Let me get to this anticipatory love. I'm shifting here. 
and uh, praise the Lord, First Peter chapter 2. Don't nobody come calling me off to the side. Well, you, th you think you should have said, I said it. I said, I called, I, I called on the Lord. I said, Lord, sometimes, Lord, I lay it out that God says, keep the deal that I gave you, son. I told you when you was a minister, if you would always say what I tell you to say, I'll always give you something to say. So don't change now. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They might not say amen. They might get mad. They might walk out. They may try to call me everything but a child of God. That's all right. I'm in good company. They walked out on Jesus. They walked out on Paul. They walked out on Silas. I'm in good company. Somebody shout, yeah! Oh, Lord. I better not say that again. Woo. I felt something then. And so, yeah. Second, first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar purchased and reserved people that that it has a destination that it has an aim that it has a goal that it has a purpose. See, he didn't just love us just to be loving us. But he loved us that you should show forth the praise of him who have called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You see, Jesus saved us. Exegelo. That we should tell the world, show forth, that we're, we're saved to declare and to spread abroad to make it known widely what the Lord has done for us you see he gives us unconditional love but then when we accept that love then there is some things that God expects of us let's look at our text and we're going home uh, Isaiah chapter 5 Isaiah chapter 5. Are you with me? We're getting ready to see a little role play. Because see, Isaiah the prophet is about to move from playing the role of a prophet to playing that of a troubadour. A troubadour is a folk singer. He didn't even become a gospel singer. He became a love song folk singer. Oh Lord, there's a little gospel in it because he was singing about God, but it was a love song. And I heard a writer say he was uh, really, possibly that he was really singing, at least at first. But after a while, it got very serious. And also, if you will, you will see that uh, in the text, he plays the role of the best man. The best man is the friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist was Jesus' best man. Hallelujah. In John chapter 3 and verse 29 and 30, John the Baptist says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. John said, I'm not the groom, I'm the best man. See, you don't want a best man who wants your bride, but you want a best man who will be glad for you. So in, the, in our text, Isaiah is going to play the role of the troubadour and that of the best man. And the last thing I want to tell you before I read, 
is that Isaiah was the son according to one and one of Amon's. His father Amon's was a part of a royal lineage. Therefore Isaiah was a blue blood. Uh -huh. He enjoyed access to the royal court. He had access to the king because he was royal. He could not be denied access. So whenever Isaiah wanted to speak to the king and whenever he wanted to speak to the royal court because he was an aristocrat, because he was a blue blood, they had to hear him. And this aristocrat, this blue blood, played the role of a plaintiff in a lawsuit. For in chapter one, verse one, it says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amon, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Look at what Isaiah said when he made his complaint. In his lawsuit, he was speaking for God. He said, hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. What did God say? What was God's indictment? He said, I have raised, I have nourished and raised up children. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. Good God Almighty, his first indictment was my children. I raised them. I brought them up. And instead of them serving me, they rebelled against me. And then the second indictment was, he said, and the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know and my people doth not consider. God said, my people are dumber than the two animals that are known for being dumb and unreasoning. The ass and the ox. But they have more sense than my people. So God in chapter one was using Isaiah in a courtroom. But in chapter five, it switches from a courtroom to the troubadour. So him being a singer at a festival. And he says in verse one, now will I sing uh, to my well beloved. Slow it down here, little Rocky. A little bit, Brother Clarence. He, he Clarence getting happy over here. God says, I will sing to my well beloved. Now what you got to get is, uh, the prophet is singing and he's speaking for God, but he's speaking about God. So when Isaiah said, now will I, this is Isaiah himself, but he's representing God. He says, now will I sing to my well beloved. Well, the well beloved that Isaiah was going to sing to also is God. For God is the owner of the vineyard. For God is the Lord. According to verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So the vineyard is Israel, but it belongs to the Lord. And Isaiah is singing to the Lord a love song about God and his vineyard. And he says, my well beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vines and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein let me tell you something that the people 
who heard this understood that maybe we wouldn't get right off when you read the last clause of verse one down to the second to the last clause of verse two to describe what God did with the vineyard I want you to know that it represented God extending tremendous effort according to Jerry White of Cornell University. He said it takes five years to plan, to plan and develop your vineyard until you see a mature yield and then another year to produce a vintage and then two or three more years to get a business plan together. So when you read verse one, the last clause, almost to the close of verse two, God describes five years of investment, five years of hard work, five years of pouring into this land, building a fence, getting the stones out, planting the vines. I wonder today, how much have the law invested in you? How much has the law invested in me? And what is God getting on his return in 2019? I stood here during the New Year service and I told you that God said, this is the year of seeking the law. He said, seek me and you shall find me when you've searched for me with all your heart. He said, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. And then in 2020, we stood right here and declared 2020 to be the year of God's truth. Look at what he said. He said in 19, seek me. He said in 20, hallelujah, God's truth. In 2021, he declared that we are worshiping service and then COVID broke out and some of us act like God have not invested anything in us but some of us are able to stand the ground to stand our ground because we sought the Lord when he told us to we called on him when he told us to we preached his truth when he told us to and now with all this stuff breaking out we're able to go through because God invested in us because the Lord prepared us long ago for what's going on right now I wonder, can you look back over your life and see how the law have been investing in you? Can you see how the Lord got the stones out? How the Lord fits you in? How the Lord did all the things that was necessary for you to be able to stand your ground. If you can look back and see it, you ought to throw your hands up and thank God for his investment. Wow! Thank you, Lord. Woo! Look at somebody and say, Jesus! have been investing 
in me. That's why I'm able. Oh, I'm able to stand my ground. I'm able to go through. Able to live holy because he's been investing. Hallelujah. He's invested in this old boy for a long time. He invested in me when I met Elder Turner. He invested in me when my mama told me about Jesus. He invested in me when I was serving Bishop Wood. He's invested in me. But I found out that when God invests in you, he invests with anticipation. He invests looking for something. He looks for something in return. He invests and he's anticipating that when times get hard, you will act like he's been investing in you. When he invests in you, he, he, he looks to see who's gonna still say, I got my hand in the wine and chain and I'm going on in Jesus' name. He's invested in my soul. He's invested in my joy. And I'm glad, good God Almighty, that he's invested. And in our text, he invested in the vineyard. And after he invested, he began to look. He began to look. He began to look. Up a room he's looking. I don't know what they preach down the street, but I know what I told you. I don't know what the priest told the Catholics, but I know what I told you. I don't know what the Baptist preacher said, but I know what I told you. And if you're afraid, you hadn't been listening. If you're scared, you hadn't been listening because the Lord has been getting us ready for a day like today. And he's expecting us to bring forth good graves. He's looking for us to stand in these last days and let the world know that Jesus still, Jesus is the only savior, that Jesus is still able to keep you in trying time that he's able to keep you when you walk through the valleys of the shadows of death you've heard enough to be able to hold up under any pressure because he's been pouring in you and pouring in us 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 you ought to have running in your feet. Ah, you ought to have clapping in your hands because he's been pouring. He's been pouring. He's been pouring. Somebody say yeah. Somebody say yeah. Look at somebody, look at someone and ask them, what is the Lord getting uh, on return for his investment? All the people who've loved you, all the people who've prayed for you, all the money that's been thrown at the war on poverty, all of the welfare, all of the safety nets, all of the school teachers, everything that's been invested in you, I want to know what are you doing with it. Oh, God want to know based on what he's told you, good God almighty, what are you doing with it? I've been saved too long to be stumbling and fumbling now. I've been born again too long to be confused now. I know, oh Lord, based on what he's invested in me, I know that my Redeemer liveth. How 
many of you know? How many of you know? I'm looking around. Some of you seem to be a little confused, but those who can look back and just think of all that the Lord have done. Yeah. See, to, an, to anticipate is to look with excitement for a coming event. God's been excited since 2019 to see how you would go through 2021. That's why I told you in 19, call on me. Told you in 20, stand on my truth. Well, now he's looking for us to act like we've been told, to act like we've heard something, to act like the word of God have been shared abroad in our hearts. Yeah! Ah, yeah! Yeah, Lord! Ah, yeah! Oh, Lord! I want you to, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to point at, uh, look at your neighbor, but point at me and say to your neighbor, the reason he's like that is that God has been investing in him. He planted me in good ground. He got the, he got the stones out of my soul. He put a fence around me. He built a tower. Yeah! Oh! you today what about you have God invested in you somebody say yeah. oh Lord that's why you go that's why you go preach real good women's day too much, too many years. Found it in your mother, found it in your grandmother, Come, persuaded us in you. Somebody wave your hand and say, too much. Uh, bro, Brody, your daddy, Mama, they know Jesus real good. And uh, so much have been invested in you. Man, you got to stand when you think of where you come from and all that the Lord has done in your soul. You ought to tell God, I know that I can make it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lord. Oh. High in the world, high in the world, high in the world. Can I be a, a son? of Turner, scared. I was raised in the house of Turner. Your husband, a man among men, he sweated manhood, he walked manhood, he reeked manhood, he preached manhood. Everything was man about him. How you gonna be his son? And then be scared. He was so much man that when he passed away, his remains said, man. Hallelujah. You're looking at God's man remains. You couldn't 
You know, sometimes you see somebody and you feel sorry. You couldn't feel, you feel pain. You felt pain. I hope y'all hear me now. Because you know sometimes other people don't hear you. You felt pain, but you didn't feel pity because of the kind of man he was. And you knew he was around the throne. You'd much rather have him here but God didn't see it that way. Point I'm making is, he poured. He poured. How in the world can some of you be here? And so afraid. I know how. It's your buddies. It's your choice. Men chose doctors rather than light because their deeds preacher their deeds were evil it's what they wanted coaches don't play they may have played but coaches coach coaches take players and they pour into them they get them in shape first first thing they're going to do they'll get you in shape well the first thing they're going to do they're going to run off the non athletes that's, 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 that's the whole purpose of hot, hot two-a-days and three-a-days. We got to get rid of those who ain't worth a nickel because they're going to take up too much space. So we know how to get rid of them. We're going to run them off. Run right about that fifth wind sprint. They, they get to the finish line and keep going. You won't see them no more because they're not of material. Now, when you're down to your team, you pour into them. You train them. You make sure they know the plays. You make sure they know the nuances. And then after all that teaching and training, you put them on the court or you put them on the field. And the coach stands there filled with anticipation. Looking at his running back, his forward, his point guard, his center. Looking at the receiver, knowing that he's trained him, and they call the play. He expects that person with glee to perform because he knows what he put in them. Anticipation is looking to a forward event with excitement. After the Lord did all that, five years of labor, five years then he anticipated a vintage. When the grapes came forth, after God going through and presenting the ideal environment to flourish, some of God have given us the ideal environment to grow. And you still won't grow. Young man, come in, and I'll grow folk who've been here for years. You know why? Even if they've been in the ideal environment all these years, but they don't want it. So that's what that is. Next thing you know, some young girl coming out the street and flourish where you struggle because you didn't want it. It's ideal, but if the but if a person don't want to do, you can't make. So when God looked for, I'm, I'm done, when he looked for the vine, the grape, the Bible said he brought forth wild grapes. Wild grapes meant that they were sour and they had a repulsive stench. So the great, the owner, the well-beloved, knew he couldn't use them. Five years gone down the drain. I wonder how God felt all these closed churches. I done pulled out the Holy Ghost. You got your Bible on your cell phone, Bible on your laptop, Bible in your lap, and you got Bible everywhere. 
We done had prayer meetings after prayer meetings, convocations after convocation, workers meeting after workers meeting, national meetings after national meetings. We got AIM. We got the men's ministry. We got the women's community. All of these things. And, we, and, and, and after years of doing it, a little short man about that tall said, close your church. Tony, close your church. And everybody did it. And very few said, well, can't we just trust God anyway? Can't, can't we just believe God? Can't, can't we just, uh, we just, hey, we believe that worship is worth the risk. Can't, can't we just come in and just have prayer? No, after all that investing, God's waiting. Oh, oh, he's going to catch that pass. He's going to make the right throw. He's going to make the right pass. And the ball hit him in the hands and he dropped it. Or the quarterback overthrew him. Or the man missed, uh, he's seven feet tall and missed the layup. You know what, you know what a good coach does? He do what God did. God said, now, and notice what he did. Notice the nuance. He moves from a courtroom in chapter one to the citizenry of chapter five. You know why he goes to the citizenry? Because he knows in a courtroom he's going to get a, a guilty verdict. So he goes from being a lawyer to a singer. And he asks the men of Judah right. to judge. Yeah. Not a jury. Citizens. Y'all judge. What more could I have done that they would bring forth a good grapes and they brought forth wow? What else could I have done? And the answer is nothing. And you know what God did then? He says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll remove my fence. I'll remove my hedge. I won't clear the grounds anymore. I'll let thorns grow in it. I'll let, I'll let rocks grow in it. And not only that, but I'll speak to the rain. And say, don't you rain on this ground no more. You know why? Because out of all of my investing in them, they did not step up when it was time. Now I got a question for you. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are we doing? A broom, he's invested in us heavily. I've given you Jesus. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you the Bible. Black folk as a race, woo! Go back two or three generations and uh, just a few generations and you were slave. Look at how I raised you up. And now you without apology side with people who curse me. Black Lives Matter says, F your Jesus. And yet you put that logo in your church. As good as I've been to you, with all of the investments that I've poured into you, you were nothing. You were nothing. Some of you, some of us, was considered to not be all the way human. You were, especially the slaves in the South, and that was, by the way, a comparison, if I'm not mistaken, to free black men. So they didn't consider all blacks. Like, but it was a comparison between the slaves and the free. But anyway, God says, I brought you from all that. From all of that. I've invested in you. No, I've invested in you. I've invested in you. I've tried. I've reached out to you. But you wouldn't reach back. You wouldn't reach back. You know what he says? I ain't reaching no more. What are we going to do with God's investment in us? For there is his unconditional love. And then there is what he anticipates based on what has been invested in him. I have very, very well behaved. They ain't perfect. But I have very I have well behaved grandchildren. 
But I'm not surprised. I, I said they're not perfect, but they're very well behaved, well mannered. But I'm not surprised that they are based on what their parents put in them. Now, if they are baby kids, after all that have been put in them, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Some of you college students, we know what the youth department has invested in you. And you go to school and backslide. Wow. What's that all about? We've invested too much in you for you to do that. All of a sudden, you're nuanced. You come home confused. I'm not quite sure anymore. What? With all that had been invested in you. Who's offended by that is God. Mama, I'm not quite sure if I want to be a Christian anymore. Or not. I don't even know if I really believe in Christianity. God looking at you saying, what? What? I expected you by now to be a preacher based on what I put in you. And here you are in doubt. You're way behind. There is an accounting. There is uh, a day of reckoning. This is good preaching. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible said that God got up early sending prophets. Everybody didn't witness to you. You the one. Everybody has witnessed to you. Everybody done prayed for you. Everybody has reached out, but you still ain't saved. All that investing. What's wrong with you? Why, why, are you? why are you being such a tough, hard nut to crack? Why? When it's like that, you make God give up. In Luke 13, the tree was on the ground, taking up nourishment, but it wasn't producing. Jesus said, cut it down. Why encumbereth? it the ground. Why let it take up space if it ain't going to produce? Read your Bible. You'll see that I'm telling you the truth. I ain't making up nothing. <laughs> Anything. Everybody's standing. Running late today. Running behind. Some of these messages, I guess I need to stop saying this because it seems like all of them. It takes a minute to preach them. But I, I've got to get this to you. See, because the times are what they are. And I'm going to tell you something. We won't take down. We will not be intimidated. God has invested too much. I just saw a tape. I can't describe it because they hadn't released it. I got a call from the leader of Love, of love Life, my son-in-law. We had a discussion concerning him. He didn't even know what was going on. And they told me a vision that they wanted to do. And they told me the role that they wanted him to play. And I said, I believe it's God. Call him. And uh, they haven't released it yet, so I, I can't jump the gun. But the role called for him to take the investment that God put in him and then the investment that he put in himself by meeting God. I don't know if anybody ever meets God halfway, but, you know, do what humans do. But then God was able 
to take that investment and it's not money and use it that will save lives from now to Jesus come. And it's already done. It's already done. But we can't talk about it. Can't release it. It's, it's already done. But when I saw it, tears welled up in my eyes because he used the investment that God put in him for the cause. What are you doing? It ain't the will of God for everybody just to come to church and sit down. You elders and ministers, some of y'all don't do anything. You think you've done your part just by showing up. That don't count. That's why I call basement service. Starter. God wants to use you. Uh, young ladies, I spoke of you all, Karis and Kyla, in the first service. I'm not surprised that you're the kind of young ladies that you are. I know what your parents invested in you. I don't know if they wanted to go all the time, but you had them in 8 o'clock class. I knew something was going to happen. And whether they wanted to be there or not, they looked like they wanted to be there. I was very moved by that. I, I, can, go, I can go down the road. Dear Jesus, Hallelujah. Father, it is our desire to be a return on your investment. You have given us Jesus. You have poured out the Holy Spirit. You have given us doctrine. You have given us the word of God. Lord, and to anticipate also means to move in advance to prevent certain things. God, you have anticipated bullets, crashes, things that could have happened that would have kept us from being used today, you went ahead of us and stopped all of those things. We're where we are today because of your anticipatory love. Mm. Thank you for moving on our behalf. Thank you for blocking the devil. That's why he saved you. Say, say, that was an anticipatory move. Kept the car. Lord, even just this week while we were on vacation, John, you saw it coming down, coming up the road. Somebody came down outside. God stopped the car. Long before anything could happen, anticipate. Because see, God wanted this sermon preached. Father, we thank you for your anticipation. Now, Father, anoint us to be a good return on your investment in the name of Jesus for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Give the Lord praises.